Hello, everyone, and welcome to APS Webinars. This is the first broadcast in the industry webinar series, Activating Industry Physics Careers. The title of today's webinar is Show Me the Money, Compensation in Physics Industry with Peter Fisk. I'm Stephanie Hervey, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We also have Sarah Monk here to support the broadcast, and Sarah coordinates membership and volunteer engagement at APS. Thank you all for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. APS membership gives you easy access to valuable career information and resources like this webinar, which allows you to get your research out to the community and network with potential employers or colleagues at our meetings and have a greater positive impact about issues that are important to you through grassroots advocacy. It can also help you connect to your community of like-minded folks through participation in our forums, divisions, and topical groups. If you're not yet an APS member, but you value things that APS provides, we encourage you to, con to consider joining today. Public policy increasingly is determined by technical considerations. Science is a major component of many issues with Congress, in which Congress must grapple. Climate change, energy policy, COVID, communications technologies, and many, many more. The aim of the APS and AIP in sponsoring these fellowships is to provide a public service by making available individuals with scientific knowledge and skills to members of Congress, few of which have technical background. In turn, this program enables scientists to broaden their experience through direct involvement with legislative and political processes. Applications are now open, and the program welcomes individuals from industry backgrounds and diverse combinations of experiences. APS has a new jobs board. Your next career move in academia, national labs, and industry, and more is just a few clicks away. Browse open positions and create alerts for new job postings. Some quick housekeeping before we begin the webinar. The first portion of our broadcast will be, will be a presentation by the speaker, and then we will have a period of Q&A at the end. If you would like to ask a question, please type it in the Q&A panel, which you can access by clicking the button on the lower right-hand side of your Zoom webinar window. You can submit questions at any time, and we are do our best to answer all of them during the broadcast. You can also adjust your audio settings using the bottom left of your window, and you can also turn on live captioning by clicking the arrow next to the live transcript in the Zoom menu. The link to the recording of today's presentation will be made available on the APS webinars homepage within two to three business days. You can, and as you leave today, we encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, let me double click on that and say every time you give us advice about what was helpful, what was valuable, we modify the programming. So this is yours. Uh, let us know what, what is most valuable to you and we'll keep delivering it. Please do. Thank you so much for that, Peter. Lastly, before we dive in, I wanted to mention that the next broadcast that we're having in this series will be on women in the physics industry in October, and we will have some incredible panelists joining us for that one. And this will be followed by two more webinars in the remainder of 2023. And we have exciting topics planned for the rest of the series. So if you haven't done so already, please sign up for our webinar mailing list using the link shown. And you can also find more information about these broadcasts on our main webinars homepage. So with that, let's get started. Our speaker today is Peter Fisk, Dr. Peter Fisk of the National um, sorry, Alliance for Water Innovation, is a seasoned executive with more than two decades of experience leading technology organizations and initiatives across industries such as water, renewable energy, defense, and natural resources. He has successfully commercialized several technologies, including reactive atom plasma, processing for optic semiconductor manufacturing and biomimicry inspired high efficiency fluid mixing and process control technology. Oh, ooh, that's a mouthful. And has served as a board member or advisor to a number of technology startups. As CEO of Pax Water Technologies, his team won several major industry awards for advertising and design and maintained profitable growth of 
greater than 20% per year, culminating the acquisition of the company in January 2017 in an all cash transaction. Dr. Fisk is also nationally recognized author, lecturer, teaching innovation, entrepreneurship, and personal career strategy to scientists and engineers in industry research. He is a regular contributor to Nature and a past columnist for science. His articles also appeared in New Scientist. Fisk is an author of Put Your Science to Work, which is amazing, and it's the most widely read career strategy guide for early career scientists and engineers. I'm sure Peter will tell us all about that today. With that, I will hand it over to our speaker. Please take it away, Peter. Thank you, Stephanie, and great to see everybody today. Um, happy to have you here. Um, and the way we'll run today is I'm going to give you about uh, maybe 40, 45 minutes of, of content. I would encourage you as you as, as questions come to you, uh, put them in the Q and A, and then Sarah and Stephanie can I can can answer them at the end. And uh, we look forward to hearing uh, all the interesting questions and maybe even advice you have for other people. So realize you guys are also out there. You can teach the rest of your physics community about what you're learning about compensation and um, and showing the money. So that's today's uh, discussion. So as I said, so my background, let me get this started. So I have a, you know, what's interesting about careers is they really only make sense in the rearview mirror. And it's very easy to think that a physics career is just one sort of thing. But my career has kind of oscillated between several sectors. The first is geosciences and material science, which is what I got my PhD in. I've also had an extensive period of time in business. And I've also been teaching uh, and teaching at the Haas School of Business and also mentoring early career scientists, particularly when they are starting jobs and starting uh, companies. So undergrad, uh, grad school, uh, postdoc, then a tour in Washington, D.C., then uh, left D.C. for a startup, did a second startup, then went back to uh, the research environment, and then I've been teaching, et cetera. And so all along, I have been um, kind of been in these different sectors. So one of the things I'd like to share with you today is that in addition to all that regular job. I also teach in several uh, accelerator programs. The Elemental Accelerator is a climate tech uh, accelerator uh, for early stage companies. Morgan Stanley's uh, Sustainable Solutions Collaboration is another one. And then with that, I am also directly involved with several startups and mentoring zillions of others. So all this is to say, I've had a lot of experience interviewing technical professionals, setting compensation, as well as being somebody who has journeyed in, in a somewhat unusual career path. Uh, and so I'll share some of that with you today. Now, one of the other things that Stephanie alluded to was that aside from all that work I've done, I also have written extensively on the subject of career development. And this is something that I'm very passionate about because in general, you wonderful, talented physicists um, are often really needing uh, sound career advice and often the only sources of advice you're getting are from your department or your professors. And so we try in the, in the industrial physics community to give you a broader perspective, not to say that, that anything that you're hearing in academia isn't great, and it is. But one of the key messages that we'll talk about, not just in today's class, but in future classes, is that physicists can go anywhere. And so in the course of my life, I have given workshops I give an annual workshop at the American Physical Society March meeting. So some of you may have actually been there. In fact, if anybody has heard uh, me at one of these March meetings, you can drop that in the Q&A. You can tell us which meeting uh, uh, you might have heard me at. But what we will cover today is, is several topics. And I know, you know one of the key questions that's often on the mind of early career physicists is like, where do physicists end up? Where, where do we land uh, professionally? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And today's particular topic, how much they're paid. And so we'll, we'll spend some time on that. But I think that one of the key things I wanna stress and we'll, we'll kind of pivot a little bit is to not just discuss about how much you could be paid, but how much are you worth? and how to determine and how to increase your value. So how do you determine that when you might be applying for jobs? How much are you worth given your background, skills, and experience? And then 
we'll spend some time talking about the specific process of negotiating compensation and how to negotiate effectively uh, so that you can maximize the compensation package that uh, that you that you're entitled to. But I want to get back to this question: How much are you really worth? And more importantly, in thinking about your career and frankly your life, how do you find places where you can create the greatest value? Because that's where you can have sometimes the best compensation is by creating the most value. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. Okay. All right, so where do physicists go? I will uh, credit my friend and colleague, uh, Crystal Bailey from American Physical Society, who gives a presentation, a longer presentation on this, but let's just talk about the most common career path for people who have a undergraduate major or a, or a PhD in the field of physics. And the American Institute of Physics has a statistical group that look and notice, first of all, with an undergraduate in physics, only 20% will proceed on to get a PhD. So 80% of undergraduates in physics will go on to do something other than a canonical PhD in physics. And so one of the things that I think we always try to stress is that while you've been in academia for so long, it's very easy and natural to think that the most appropriate or normal path for a physicist is simply to go um, and work uh, in the academic setting as a professor. It turns out that's actually a really rare outcome. Most physicists are happily employed doing a whole bunch of other stuff besides being in academia. And this is true at uh, in the case of bachelor's graduates, where bachelor's graduates um, have a range of outcomes. But you can see here in this chart that of uh, graduating physics majors, the majority land in the private sector somewhere as opposed to going on to uh, academia. And within that private sector, within that 70%, here is the sort of breakdown. You have people moving into engineering occupations with a physics degree, computer science and information systems and other uh, technical areas with a physics PhD. So one of the things I often notice is I don't see a lot of ads for physicists in the business or the industrial setting. I see a lot of ads for engineers. I see a lot of ads for technical people, but the word physicist tends to be viewed very narrowly and you shouldn't think of yourself so narrowly. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is sort of where the outcomes come. And then when we move up to master's degree holders in physics, again, we see that the dominant sector where master's uh, physics holders is in the private sector. And for those, they move into these settings. Again, you notice here how much engineering uh, sort of job titles are an appropriate place for a physics graduate to, to land. Then we get to PhDs. And there's something like 1,600 PhDs in physics uh, trained in the United States every year. And even at that point, even for people who've proceeded all the way through to a PhD, um, while it seems like half end up in academia and half end up in other things, including industry and national labs, for example, where I work, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, most of the academic positions are actually temporary. The first assignments that people get after their PhD are typically a postdoc. If you separate out those temporary jobs and you look at the wheel, you notice that permanent jobs after a PhD industry dominates. In academia, it's gonna be typical that you do an additional postdoc or maybe two before you, if you decide to stay in an academic setting to, to, to land in a, in a permanent uh, position. So all this is to say, while you spent most of your time here in this little wedge, most physicists do not end up working in academia. And that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. And it's a great thing because physicists are enormously talented and we need you in a wide variety of settings. Okay, so what is the most common career path? Industry is the most common career path. And so one of the key things that you can do as uh, an undergrad or in grad school, long before you graduate, is start familiarizing yourself with people in industry. 
not only coming to APS panel sessions uh, that describe their various career paths in different industrial sectors, but even in your own university, you yourself can organize and bring people from industry onto your campus to have a panel discussion for you and your fellow uh, physicists. So one of the key things I emphasize is being proactive in exploring your career is a healthy and valuable thing to do. Not only that, but you learn a lot about not just industry jobs, but about leadership and organization. So I said that physicists can go anywhere. And so as uh, Stephanie noted, I've written several books on the subject of career development. And one of the things I've done is I have sought out PhDs, PhD scientists, and I found them in a wide variety of career fields. It's kind of amazing. Um, I find them tucked away in some places you'd never expect. And so in my book, I have a bunch of profiles of people, but this two column chart shows you, I've scrambled this up a little bit, and I want you to look at this two column chart. And I want you to tell me what you think the most logical connection is between the PhD on the left and the job on the right. Look at these and you tell me, what do you think is the most likely link? Sarah? Sarah, you tell me, what do you, when you look at this list, what do you think is the most likely connection between the PhD on the left and the job on the right? Um, I would say probably Just give me one. Maybe Try one. Bi biophysicist and experimental physicist. Okay, biophysicist experimental. It would make a lot of sense. Physics and physics, right? Makes a lot of sense. Well, when I met these people, I was really surprised that in fact, um, I found PhD trained people, PhD trained scientists in a very wide and strange set of environments and roles. And this is not to say that what you do for uh, your PhD or what you do for your undergrad will be totally uncorrelated with what you do for the rest of your life. But my point is that you can potentially have outcomes that move you very, very far from your discipline. And in fact, sometimes have enormous impact on the world, like the theoretical chemist, two thirds of the way down this list. Does anybody know who that theoretical chemist is who turned out to be the chancellor of Germany? Angela Merkel. In fact, I think one of the things that made her a very effective leader of Germany was the discipline and, um, and thoughtfulness that she put into the work of leading a country. So it's not to say that every physicist is going to grow up and become the chancellor of Germany. I'm not saying that. But I do think that a lot of times physicists think very narrowly about what they're capable of doing, and what they're qualified to do. Hey, Peter, uh, any information yeah. about the Rodeo Star? Sure. The Rodeo Star was a person I met, a friend of mine at Stanford. His name is Grady Grissom. And Grady had a really interesting experience. He grew up in Wyoming, in Cody, Wyoming, which is, you know, for those of you who don't know the United States, Wyoming is about as cowboy as it gets. And so in high school, uh, 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 Grady was on sort of the all state rodeo uh, team. So he was a really good rodeo uh, kid. It turned out, Stephanie, that he ended up doing his undergraduate degree at Princeton University. He was a few years ahead of me. And oddly, Stephanie, Princeton didn't have a, a very evolved rodeo program. But um, after his PhD at Stanford, he was facing a really interesting dilemma because while he had a very successful PhD experience, one of the things that he always missed was some of that out of doors experience of life uh, on the rodeo. And he thought, well, maybe he can do it as a hobby, et cetera. And then in his fourth year in grad school, Grady happened to notice that nearby from Stanford in the town of Livermore, California, there's an annual amateur rodeo. And in fact, there's a competition and the top winner could win $5,000, which to a grad student is a lot of money. And so Grady decided to go out and sign up and get in the rodeo. And it turns out that at the end of the weekend, Grady Grissom was the number one top champion and took home a big trophy of a horse, of course, and a check for $5,000. And 
he walked away from that experience really kind of exhilarated and also kind of confused because up until this point in his life, he had spent all his time thinking, I'm going to go on in geosciences. I'm going to have a postdoc. Um, and in fact, he had a postdoc offer by the time he did this rodeo thing. And so he went to his advisor and he told his advisor he wanted to uh, postpone the postdoc for one year. And Grady to himself came up with a little bargain for himself. He said, well, I'm going to pause my scientific career for one year and I'm going to go out on the amateur rodeo circuit. And if I can earn more on the amateur rodeo circuit than I can in my postdoc salary, then maybe I might want to reconsider things. And he went out in the very first year, he won like $50,000 across a bunch of competitions and which of course was much more than the postdoc he was going to be paid. But more importantly, Grady really found his loving life. And at the end of that year, he made the momentous decision to apologize and turn down his postdoc offer. And he has proceeded to become a national rodeo star. And he is now successful, retired, and lives in California. <laughs> now, it's funny, Stephanie, that you asked me about Grady, because, you know, a lot of people might listen to that story and say, oh, well, like, what a waste. Like, oh, he did a whole PhD, and now he's doing rodeo. Like, why did he bother? And so I asked Grady that question. And I said, you know, so as you reflect, was it a mistake to go and get your PhD? And he said, no, not at all. He said, I love those years doing research. I had extraordinary experiences doing geological research in Canada. And the most important thing was I had a marvelous experience that let me know that I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. And so sometimes it's important to be open to the possibility of making a move and making a change. And this is one valuable thing that with a physics degree, you are enormously valuable. And this is what we'll talk about next, Stephanie, because you know there is, as you said, very natural in the sciences to have what I call a Gaussian fallacy about your life. And that is that whatever you do for your undergrad or your PhD, et cetera, that the entire rest of your life will kind of be like normally distributed around that PhD topic or whatever. And that's not actually true. In fact, what you do in your schooling and your training gives you a very great specific set of information, but you have the potential for all sorts of outcomes in your life. It's not a symmetric distribution at all. And there's physics-ish stuff over here that you could do, but then there is a tail of possible outcomes for you that honestly goes out as far as the eye can see. And, and I admit, Stephanie, there's not a lot of area under this tail. As I said, not every five, fifth PhD in, in theoretical chemistry becomes the Chancellor of Germany. But I think we tend to feel like we're kind of locked in. And I'm simply saying, as I've met physicists in a wide variety of career fields, I can assure you that there are more options than you realize. Now, also, I know that that can sometimes be a little daunting, right? And this was daunting to me because even when I was a grad student, I was a little concerned about whether academia was really the right path for me. I wasn't an unsuccessful grad student and I in fact enjoyed a lot of the process of grad school, but I really wasn't sure that it was for me. And in fact, this question of what scientists do for a living is not a new question. Here is a quote, uh, young people themselves don't realize how valuable they are with a science degree. It gives an ability to think deeply, solve problems, analyze, criticize, and be criticized. Science trained graduates often don't realize the breadth of what they're capable of doing. And I certainly didn't realize that when I was still in, in college and in grad school. This, by the way, is a quote from an article from 1994, before a lot of you were born. So we've been dealing with this issue of what scientists can do for a living for a long time. And one of the happy things I will report to you is that with a physics degree, you possess many of the traits and skills that are actually of highest value in the world, okay? And this gets back to the compensation thing. I know at this point you're like, when is he gonna start talking about salaries? Okay, I'll get there. But first of all, let's talk about value. And this was really hard for me to con conceptualize because I'd spent all these years in undergrad and grad school developing very specific technical skills. And I believed that my technical skills were the most valuable thing about me. Okay. And 
through a little bit of a journey, I ended up meeting some uh, very great uh, uh, counselor at the Stanford Career Planning and Placement Center. And he sent me away with an assignment. He said, I want you to go back to your office and I want you to write down all the transferable skills you've learned while in grad school. Not the specific stuff, which in my case was solid state nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Not that, but the broader stuff. And then come back to me next week. So I went back to my office and I started writing. And I said, so grad school gave me the ability to function in a wide variety of environments and roles. I mean, I was... Um, I was uh, certainly, I was a modeler. I did computer modeling. I did experimental design. I did spectroscopy. Uh, I was a Xerox copier repairman very often. I did lots of different stuff and I had to do it on my own. Teaching skills, conceptualizing and explaining complex subjects to people, very powerful skill beyond just science. Counseling and interviewing skills, public speaking experience. A lot of people don't appreciate how much public speaking experience you get while you are in an undergraduate or graduate school experience. Supporting a position with argumentation and logic, designing, I kept writing and 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 writing. And you wanna know something? I actually felt a little bit better. And I took my list back to my counselor and he said, did you appreciate that you know a science degree teaches you these things? And the answer is, you know, we don't really talk about it. We talk about the science because we think that's what matters. We don't talk about this other, these other transferable skills. And he said, these are the things that really make a difference in a successful career. And it's not just, you know, transferable skills. There's also personal traits and qualities that physics grads tend to have in abundance. I mean, let's face it. You wouldn't be here on this call with us today if you weren't at least pretty smart, right? And this is one of the ironies about being in the physics communities. Like you've hung around with all these smart people for so long that like you've even like forgotten that you're smart. Like, because there are all these other smart people around you, but you are really smart and you're clever. You make good decisions. You're analytical. You work hard. You're competitive. These are all really valuable things that employers are looking for. And so when we talk about compensation, it's important for you to think about how you present yourself as more than just a scientist, more than just a physicist. Okay. So where should physicists go? Frankly, you should go where you will be happiest and do the most good in the world. That's where you should go. If that's academia, wonderful. If that's industry, wonderful. If it's on the back of an extremely angry cow, rodeo, that's great. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this issue of compensation. So show me the money. So I don't know. Uh, I have to admit, uh, now the generations these days, Stephanie and Sarah, they may not recognize this famous quote from Jerry Maguire, 1996. Um, but the idea of show me the tangible results, show me what you can do, is sort of the underlying thing that uh, I, we want to bring forward. And, and of course, one of the questions is show me the money what is the current data? What do the current data say about where uh, physics grads earn money and how much money? And so, looking across these different categories, the American Institute of Physics had, does an annual salary survey, and you can see right here that you have a, a, a fairly wide span with these box and whisker um, plots of mean uh, and and average and and uh, distribution of salary. And similarly. In terms of physicists, um, physics PhDs, you also have an extremely widespread. Okay, so when somebody says, how much should I earn as a physicist? Uh, a lot depends on where, and then a lot depends on like what you are doing and what you are doing in the organization. And so to some extent, I also think that the starting salaries are one of a portion of things we call total compensation. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Total compensation is the complete set of things an employer is going to give to you in exchange for working at their organization. And there's a lot of additional value beyond what you see here as a starting salary. There's a lot of other elements to what we call a compensation package. And it might make sense sometimes to take a lower starting salary because some other element of the compensation package is much more valuable to you. 
We'll talk about that. So we talk about how much is, you know, where physicists work, how much are they paid? But here's the bigger question. I think the more important question, more important question is what are you worth? What are you worth to an employer? Um, what are you worth? You're priceless. Thanks, mom. You know, hey, we're all priceless. But in fact, a simple fact of economics is that in whatever job you take, your employer will likely pay you less than the value you are creating. Okay, so you may pay paid, you know, similar to somebody, you know, you one of the ways we can look at compensation is you can just simply compare two similar people in two similar jobs with similar experience and say, what's the difference in pay or what's the similarity in pay between those two people who seem similar? And that's often a very scientific or physics way to look at these things. But as I said, a more important frame for you to keep in mind is what you're worth, what you are paid is actually by necessity less than the value you create for the organization you work in. Now you might think that sounds kind of mean, why would they pay me less than I'm generating for the organization? Well, look at it this way. If you are costing an organization more than you are generating in value, they should just fire you and save the money because you're not creating value. So one of the key points I want to anchor for you is that value creation is a real critical component in thinking about, not just thinking about compensation and where you want to work, but also in arguing and negotiating a compensation package is how can you argue your value to an organization, not just that you should get paid more. So pay is correlated to value. And if you want to pay, be paid more, create more value, figure out how to create more value. Okay. So, okay. Step number one, you are priceless. And I will say also that this issue of looking for a job or even you know, like graduating or even being in grad school can be really stressful. And there can be times when you can feel like I'm not very priceless or that I'm really not sure what I'm going to do. And it can be stressful. So I'd simply give you one piece of advice is that sometimes you cannot feel that pricelessness very, very strongly. So simply, this is why you should reach out to people you, who love you and just talk to them and have them remind you um, that you are in fact priceless. Okay. So it's always important when you journey in a career search to keep in mind that it can be stressful and that it's always helpful to check in with people who love you and they can give you some additional support. But even though you're priceless to the people who love you, they're not going to pay you. An employer is going to pay you. So one way to think about compensation is, well, there are other people like me who have taken similar jobs. So let's look at the data of like how people similar to me are paid in terms of my skills, knowledge and experience and in a similar job. And so, you know, the problem is often, I don't know where to look for those data. Like, how do I know how much people earn? It's not like people talk about it. So one of the key things is you're a researcher. There are ways to find out what other people earn, okay? How do you find this information out? First of all, just ask people. I know it sounds weird or rude, but one of the things we'll talk about in this series is the critical role that networking plays, not just in like identifying job opportunities and getting hired, but your network is also a principal source of information about things like compensation, like what's appropriate, what's the range, what did you hear the last time somebody was hired? So your network, the people who are you know and are willing to help you, those people in your network, those are the people who you can ask this question. Now. Another resource, especially if you are at a college or university, many colleges and universities have a career planning and placement center. And the career planning and placement center is a great wealth of resources for you, not the least of which they often have salary surveys. And then many of the people who've gone through that, that office and are now working have shared information back with the career planning and placement center. So check out your career planning and placement center if you're interested in information about compensation. Now, the other place where it is totally appropriate to talk about compensation is if you do informational interviews. Now, we aren't going to talk about informational interviewing as a particular strategy today, but we will probably talk about it later in the series. And it is one of the key skills and key activities that I recommend uh, in our March meeting workshop for how you can broaden your exposure 
to opportunities and learn important details, okay? So asking people is one key way that you can get this information. The other way you can get this information, as I said, being a researcher and finding this data out. Now we've already pointed out that organizations like the American Institute of Physics have salary surveys and that's great. It turns out that there are also published databases you can find, especially for public sector organizations. There are also sometimes salary ranges that are posted in job ads, particularly outside the United States. This is not done so much in the United States, but in many countries outside the United States, it is very appropriate for them to publish a salary range with a job opening. Lastly, there are salary and compensation websites. So let's look at each one of these things. So I work at the University of California, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, even though it's a Department of Energy National Lab, we are run by the University of California. And so they have a published academic salary scale and all sorts of, they have published scale for postdocs, published scale for research assistants, et cetera. So you can go onto these websites and see what the current policies are with respect to compensation, okay? Now, University of California is even more interesting because in addition to publishing general, general salary scales, they actually have a database where you can look up individual people and you can see their compensation. So for my colleague and friend, David Sedlak, who's a full professor at UC Berkeley, I am able to go on this database and find out exactly how much David earns. So you can find this information. University of California is very unusual in this regard. It's very high transparency. Now, beyond a public sector organization where publishing salaries might actually be legally ob obligated, even in the private sector, there are wonderful databases like Glassdoor, where you can sign up and set up an account, and then you can begin to explore and understand for a job title of physicist, what do they call that if I am working, for example, in Seattle, Washington, Sarah, for Boeing, and I have a PhD in physics, what does Boeing call me? Well, they call you typically a systems engineer, even though I didn't get an engineering degree. Okay, and how much do they pay you? You can compare your salary to other systems engineering jobs in comparable organizations besides Boeing. So it's really nice. It's a way to really gather great information. Glassdoor is one, salary.com is another, and there are others. And for those of you uh, in, in Pakistan or India or uh, Brussels, I'm sure there are very variants of some of this information available to you online. Also, don't forget that your network is not just the people you know, but LinkedIn is your network. LinkedIn is the largest uh, sort of a professional networking uh, uh, website. And after setting up a profile, you can join different groups in different professional settings. And you can literally ask people in these group settings, what is a physicist, somebody with a job title of physicist, what do they earn in these different settings? And so you can get this information, okay? Now, you can get an information about numbers. And as I said before, a lot of people tend to focus on um, the salary as the kind of sum of compensation. But I wanna to emphasize to you that in fact, what you should be thinking about is a total compensation. And not just during negotiation and offer, but even when you consider different jobs in different environments. As I said, you could have one job whose base salary is lower, but has much better healthcare and retirement benefits and other factors that might make the total compensation package more valuable to you. The other thing is different things matter to different people, right? It's not all just about salary. Maybe some of you um, are really interested in having a job that has more flexibility or maybe even not working 40 hours a week, maybe 30 hours a week. In which case that's valuable. Even though you might be paid less, the flexibility is valued. And so one key element I recommend is when you consider negotiating an offer, first of all, whenever possible, try to delay the discussions of salary and compensation as long as possible. Um, don't try to qualify yourself or disqualify yourself during an interview where somebody says, well, uh, so we are, are paying about $60,000 uh, for this position. Uh, is that acceptable to you? Defer those discussions. Say, thanks very much for that information. I think 
we should talk about total compensation when an offer's on the table, we can discuss the scope of the job, okay? So try not to get locked in. But more importantly, value the offer fully. As I said before, we tend to be preoccupied with salary and tend to ignore vast other elements of a compensation package, healthcare, how often you're gonna be reviewed and eligible for a raise, whether there's a bonus plan, whether in the process of selling something, you might actually get a commission on the volume of business you do. If it's a startup, stock options can be the most valuable element of a total compensation package. If you're with a large organization, a pension plan, which is a retirement plan, can be very, very valuable. Profit sharing, some companies and organizations will actually have a fund to pay for your additional professional education. You could potentially get thousands of dollars of tuition support while you're a full-time employee. Don't forget the stability of the company. You know, one of the exciting things about a startup is that it's the potential to go really fast and, and potentially, if it's successful, have a huge economic win. But it might be very volatile. So you have to know when that's appropriate or when that's okay for you. As I said, tuition reimbursement, all these other things, leave policies, flex time, very important now, where is the work uh, site and how often are you gonna be expected to be on site versus can you work remotely? Can you work 100% remotely? That can make a huge difference in the total value. So these are all elements of a compensation package. There is more than just base salary. So this gets into one of my biggest pieces of advice about negotiating, okay? I know that a lot of you have sort of come to believe that negotiation is sort of some, some sort of battle, some battle between you and a potential employer. And like you ask for a big salary, they give you, offer a low salary. You fight it out together until you kind of get to somewhere in the middle. And it turns out that's actually not, not the way the best negotiators work. The best negotiators work First of all, by recognizing that this is a value problem that both sides have, okay? What I mean by that is that you have an understanding of your skills, knowledge, and abilities and ability to create value for the organization. And they have a perspective on what the role is and what the range of value that somebody in that role could do, right? On the one hand, they could say, "Some we don't know this person that we're considering hiring. We don't know you. And so I'm going to go with a salary similar to what I've done before, et cetera. And then you're sitting there like, well, you don't know me and you don't know what I'm capable of doing. And I think I'm capable of doing a lot. So I think my salary, my, my reward for the value could be different. So how do you deal with this? First of all, one of the key things that nego good negotiators know is that there are all these different knobs, right? It's not just an argument about base salary. In fact, base salary can often be one of the most narrow elements in a compensation negotiation. Often an employer, you look at this list, some of these other things are, the employer has a lot more flexibility. And so in thinking about a negotiation, first of all, the first step is for you to write down all the elements that are in the comp total compensation package. And if you don't know, you should ask, just ask. Oh, you know, by the time somebody is offering you a job, they'll say, and the salary is $72,000. And I said, thank you very much. Um, what is your healthcare plan? How often do people get reviewed for races? Is there a bonus? Is there a commission? Are there stock options? What's the work? I and mean, all these sorts of elements. And what you do is you write down all these details, okay, in a list. All right. Now, what you do is you look at that list and you rank them from the things that are most important to you to the things that you have a lot of flexibility on. For example, maybe your partner to whom you're married has a job with great health benefits. In fact, you're fully covered on their health benefits, which means you, know, you can be flexible about health benefits. You don't actually really need the health benefits from from this job offer because you're already covered. That means you got a lot of flexibility there. Well, companies pay a lot of money for healthcare for their employees. So that could be a knob that the employer cares a lot about, but you're very flexible on. You see what I'm doing here? We have one list of criteria that you rank in terms of your priority. The employer has the same list 
And they have some things that they have flexibility on and some things that they have not a lot of flexibility on. List of elements on one axis, same elements on the other axis. What is this sounding like, people? It's a matrix. The best negotiators essentially are diagonalizing a matrix. They're figuring out the optimum value combination across all these different questions. And it's not a question of fighting. It's not a question of battling and arguing about your value. It's a question of asking questions. Do you have flexibility? One of the most um, professional ways to do negotiation is simply by asking, what are all the elements of the compensation package? What is your offer? What are the what are the terms that you're offering me in each one of these things? And do you have flexibility on this? This one's very important to me. Do you have flexibility? And they can say, well, you know, a little bit. What do you have in mind? And then some things you can say, well, I actually don't need health insurance. So instead of health insurance, would you just pay me a $500 bonus a month, which is a third the cost of the health insurance plan you'd pay for me? You win and I win. I get $500 more per month and you don't have to pay $1,500 a month for my health insurance. So these are ways in which you can think about negotiation as a partnership to achieve maximum value. The best compensation package for you and the most affordable compensation package for them. That is how effective negotiators work. And by the way, when I encounter, and I have encountered people who do a very good job of this in a job search, when I'm negotiating, I'm really impressed because it's a sign of maturity and sophistication and real good strategy. So can you get the offer raised? So let's say somebody comes to you and says, well, congratulations, here's the job, it's $72,000, blah, 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 blah. One of the questions you might ask yourself is, well, how much flexibility do they have across all these knobs, right? And maybe they're saying, I don't have any flexibility, this is the job. So just consider these factors that might indicate whether the employer is flexible or not. First of all, you possess unique abilities, right? They only have one of you, they really need somebody like you. One other way you could tell is that they have few other candidates for the job. Another way that can cause your value to go up is maybe the organization's had to search for a long time and has not been successful, so they're getting desperate. It's a unique position in the organization. The organization is flexible in general, and you have other offers, okay? In contrast, if the organization has these traits, you do not have a lot of flexibility. For example, if the job is at an entry level and similar to others in the organization, eh, postdoc. If the organization is highly structured and rigid, postdoc. If the organization expects you will take what is offered, postdoc. Then you don't have a lot of flexibility in negotiation. Now, I know you're looking at this list and you're thinking, wait a minute, look at this top list. You possess unique abilities, you have few other candidates for the job. How do I know that? I don't know what their, the job search is like. All I know, all I could possibly have in terms of information is that list, the last bullet item, they really need somebody soon, or you have other offers. Now, that's the one you could know. Do I have another offer? Most of the time, the answer is no, you don't have another offer. So you don't know what the status of the job search has been for the employer, or do you? Here's one little tip. Rewind and think back during the interview. When you go on interviews for a job, okay, I know that one of the things you're thinking about is how can I make a good impression? How can I, you know, essentially be the candidate that they want to make an offer to? And that's certainly part, that's the main job for an interview. But there's another job, a secret second mission that you are on when you are in a job interview. And that is learning a little bit about how the job search has gone for the employer. What I mean by that is casually, maybe over lunch, you can be nibbling away on your salad and say, well, so you probably have had a lot of people apply for this job. And maybe in a moment of weakness, the person that you're that is interviewing you or, or sharing lunch with you might confess, well, actually, no, we uh, we started the job search last fall and we didn't get enough candidates. So we scrubbed the job search and we're trying again this spring. Interesting. Oh, you probably hire a lot of people like me, don't you? Well, no, this is really an unusual position in the organization. Interesting. 
So you may not get complete transparency, but when you are interviewing for a job, do inquire gently about how the search has gone on because that might give you some indication. Another indication, especially if um, they need somebody soon, is if you get a nice call from the person saying, hey, congratulations, Sarah, you've been, you know, we'd like to make you an offer, et cetera, et cetera. Can you reply in a week? Like, oh, okay, that's pretty fast. Well, maybe what has happened, maybe they made the offer to somebody else who turned them down. And now you're the second candidate and they're really getting concerned. So they might have more eagerness if there is time urgency. Now, all these are just strategies to think about when you are trying to understand the other party's perspective during the negotiating process. But the number one important thing to do is understand the total compensation package, all the elements of the compensation package, and where they have flexibility and where you have flexibility. Okay. Well, let's wrap up here and you know, who's worth more? Let's do a little exercise here, okay? Sarah, who's worth more? A physicist, a PhD physicist with five years experience or a PhD physicist with five years of experience? Who's worth more? Um, The one on the left. Why? Um, because the left is less sought after. <laughs> They're more unique. They're identical. If this is all you are, <laughs> Sarah, if this is all you are, this is identical, right? Okay, let's play. keep playing my game. Ready, Sarah? Who's more valuable? The physicist with five years of experience who's focused only on their specific area of their research or the physicist with five years experience who's open to exploring other technical areas beyond their research? Who's more valuable? Uh, the physicist open to exploring other areas. Okay. The physicist who is only open to their specific area of the research and responds to questions when asked, or the physicist with five years of experience open to other technical areas and is proactively seeks out ways to be helpful. Who's more valuable? Um, the physicist who is curious and open to opportunities. The physicist who identifies problems and, and limitations to propose actions, or the physicist who identifies problems and proposes fixes to proposed actions? Uh, the physicist who proposes fixes. Cares about their own career and advancement only, or cares about their colleagues and their organization's growth? Who's more valuable? Absolutely, the physicist who cares about their colleagues and organization's growth. Friends, Compensation is about value and attitude is a big impact on value. And your attitude and how you project your interest into an organization or in a job at, you know, job can make all the difference, not just about whether you get that offer, but about what that offer is when you get it. Okay. Bella, in my workshop, I talk about this issue of like, what is the perception when people say physics PhD, right? What is the image that most people have who don't live in the physics world, who don't live in academia? The image can sometimes be sort of negative, okay? I think this is one of the reasons why there are not a lot of positions for physicists advertised in the private sector. I think a lot of times they advertise or look for people, technical manager or technical sales support or, um, product engineer or something like that. Because physicists can seem sort of, let's be frank, a little nerdy, okay? But I think it's really helpful for us to unpack some of the social stereotypes that come with the word physicist, right? Because we have our little stereotype here and we have our little friend here with his pocket protector, his unwashed hair, unsophisticated, no sense of deadlines, wrinkled clothing. But look up here at the thought bubble. Very, very smart. people see physicist beside your name and they assume that you're really smart. They assume that you're a genius. They assume that you know math and all this crazy stuff. In fact, they assume that you are a lot smarter than we know you actually are. So one of the nice things about 
the stereotype of physicist is that a lot of the negative things about physicists are literally superficial. Look at this cartoon. The things here are literally superficial. And superficial things can simply be addressed by dressing professionally, communicating effectively, and being interested in other people. In fact, frankly, the bar is set so low that when you come on the scene and you are charming and just normal, people will be amazed because like, wow, she's so nice. And she's a physicist, amazing. But look, underlying the stereotype, okay, which is superficial, there are some concerns. And I have seen these concerns. I've also sometimes seen these symptoms or habits from scientists and you know academic trained people. Oftentimes the concern is not just like you're a super nerd, but that you can be simple-minded about money, that you can be impractical about time, you can have no sense of deadlines, you can be socially passive and value ideals as absolutes. Okay, those are some of the concerns that lead people to be worried about academics and sort of physics trained people. Other potential uh, perceptions that you may need to overcome, that you're not a hermit, but a leader, that you're a team player and not arrogant, that you're an organizer and not a rebel, and that you're a solution person, not a problem person. This was a little bit about what I did with Sarah on that previous slide, is that the degree to which you can show up in a job interview, and frankly, in a job, being curious, positive, productive, professional and helpful makes all the difference in your value. And that's how you get the top salary is by being more valuable. And also don't forget your own kind of misconceptions and frankly, your own prejudices. I know many of you are coming from an experience and, and training in physics where you often look at the private sector as well. Those people are just kind of dumb. They're just not as smart as us. And there's nothing they're doing that's interesting. So why would I ever take a job in industry? It'd just be drudgery. Friends, there are some really interesting problems out there. Practically every industry, every company today is a software company, whether or not they might be delivering packages or, or being a florist. The technical content in jobs today has never been greater. And guess what? You are technical masters. So... Don't think of the private sector as being bereft of interesting problems. They're fascinating problems to work on. So summing it all up, you are most valuable when you are a T-shaped person. What do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is that all your academia, right? Your, your, your degrees, your school, your research, all that stuff is very helpful. It's very specific to physics and often very narrow, okay? But it's got real depth and that depth is valuable. But if that's all you are, if I am a narrow, narrow physicist, I don't have a lot of place to fit. I have a very narrow slot, narrow set of opportunities. If instead I am simultaneous, by the way, that's what your school, that's what your training can give to you is that wonderful, deep and specific experience. But if you can cap that with a crossbar and simultaneously also be an adaptable problem solver with drive and leadership, if you can simultaneously be a subject matter expert and also a broadly adaptable problem solver, you are most valuable. You're most valuable to an organization and you will get the highest salary. But by the way, that stuff up here, you're not gonna learn that even though your PhD or undergraduate advisor may love you, you're not gonna learn that from them. You're gonna learn that work by experiences that you do on your own. That's what you've got to do for yourself. And we talk about that in the rest of this seminar series. We'll talk about some of the key strategies for developing leadership drive and some of these what we call soft skills, which are very valuable. All right, that's it for my prepared remarks, everybody. We are at the top of the hour. I think we may have accumulated some questions, so I am going to turn it back to Stephanie and Sarah, and we can go through some questions, and I look forward to uh, hearing everybody's thoughts. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Peter. That was fabulous. I do have a few questions I want to take a look at. One of them is a pretty um, simple question, but the question is, does your time working on a PhD the years of experience count as those years of experience required for a job application? I think they do. 
I have said that when I have interviewed uh, or, or, you know, complete an application, because what I try to do when I describe um, my PhD experience is I try to e explain how a PhD is very much like a job and a, and a, and a challenging job, right? A job where you have to solve new things, where you have to be incredibly resourceful. So I say when I have a technical background, and I've been in grad school for five years that I have five years work experience because grad school is work. Awesome, thank you. And we did have another question that kind of came up about the J-1 visa and not having permanent residence and industry options for those folks. So I would love to throw a question out there around that so that we can at least you know, address some of those issues and uh, feel free to elaborate on that, Peter. Absolutely, well, for starters, um, uh, uh, I think the majority of physics PhDs are non-U.S. citizens. So we want to make sure that physicists, no matter what your citizenship and status, have the maximum range of opportunities. For those of you who are interested and excited about staying in the United States, one of the key next steps is figuring out what my work authorization is and what options and, and visa status do I have to do work. Um, one of the most common things for PhDs is something called OPT, which is a period of time in which you can do practical, essentially work-based learning. It's what we sort of consider it. And there's a period of time, I think it's 36 months, that you can be on an OPT before your employer has to make a move to uh, make your status more permanent, either by assisting you for the application for an H-1B or assisting you uh, in the process of obtaining a green card is one of the, the things they do. So this, for those of you who are non-US citizens and are eager to have a career, an extensive career in the United States, this question of work eligibility can often be a dominant question in what jobs you are gonna um, go after. Because if an employer doesn't have the resources or inclination to pursue more permanent status for you, then that might be a lot less of an opportunity for you compared to an employer who says, we have a process, we review your work after six months, um, you know, we commonly uh, then pursue uh, H-1Bs for uh, non-citizen non uh, staff members. And here is our process of doing that. It's totally appropriate, Stephanie, for you during, um, as you're uh, negotiating or discussing the job opportunity to ask specifically. It's commonly the case, I will, I will also say that oftentimes people ask me, well, I'm not, I don't have, um, I'm not a US citizen, should I put that on my resume? Should I put that right out front? My answer is no. I mean, in a way, what I recommend is, you know, granted, Non-U.S. citizens, we have a legal structure in the United States, Stephanie, that strictly speaking, if you have a U.S. citizen and a non-U.S. citizen who are equivalent, our legal system is supposed to prefer the U.S. citizen, right? But no two people are equal, right? And I would rather than introduce a complication to my um, current like work eligibility, I would rather put together a resume that talks about my best strengths and experience and potential, again, with respect to the job that's that's being advertised. And I wouldn't put my visa status on the resume. Now, any employer may ask right away, and they are legally allowed to ask your work eligibility. And it is helpful to determine quickly whether um, this is an employer who has the potential to be an ally or a supporter in your journey towards um, permanent status. Um, so those are the things that, that, that I would recommend to non-US uh, non citizens who want to stay in the United States. Um, and also, I think that other grad students, and uh, if you are still in grad school, uh, your uh, uh, university may have offices that can actually give you additional support, especially during the OPT process, et cetera. So those are also uh, important resources for you to think about. But, um, you know, we uh, in this country uh, have uh, 
so much to be grateful for, for the fact that we're a country that welcomes smart, talented, ambitious um, people into our country to, to, to join our community. And so um, I know it can be daunting, but I would simply say the positivity, positivity that you show, even in asking those questions, can really make a positive impression on employers. So good luck. Thank you. That's a wonderful introduction. And just keep in mind, we have a lot of incredible webinars on this topic in our APS webinars list that does speak more specifically to the international requirements. And so absolutely want to check those out for sure. Um, one came up, a question that came in, and again, we have a lot of great questions coming in. So um, I'm trying to, we won't have time for all of them, but uh, I want to throw this out there because it is very salary related. Um, what about ageism? You know, you have to balance this idea of it's too much experience going to hurt me in the job application process, but yet help me in the salary phase. So can you chat about this idea of ageism and if it yeah. applies in the physics sector? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm 57 years old, Stephanie, so I have colleagues and friends, and I definitely have heard from them that at a certain point in your career, there's a there are new questions and they're largely you know we put it under the category of ageism but i think that it's important to maybe unpack that stereotype or that prejudice a little bit and think about what could be on the minds of a potential employer if i am a mid-career person maybe even a mid-career person making a dramatic career change what could be on the minds of an employer that would give them reservation about me as a candidate? Well, do I have all the current skills, like those youngsters, right? Okay, you can answer that. Here's what I know, here's how I do it, blah, blah, blah. Um, am I flexible? Tell stories about you being flexible. Are you, uh, you know, uh, uh, driven? Have you, have you had uh, uh, high productivity career? Tell those stories. Mostly, I think people, are, are willing to make a transition from concern or questions to interest when they think that they have a person who's a mid-career person who's shown a real particular interest in the opportunity and can tell a great story about why the opportunity is so compelling for them. And I would also say that, um, you know, another element of the, the reciprocal of ageism is its experience. And I think that one of the things you can argue in your compensation is simply that with the amount of experience you have, um, you'll get up to speed very quickly. The, you have worked in, in high performance organizations for a while. And if there is still, you get a sense that there, there you're, you've got a sort of a cap on what your a compensation is being offered. One of the other things I like to always recommend is ask people if they feel like the compensation, you're, you're in the negotiation process, you kind of end up a little lower than you thought you might. One of the great things to do is simply ask, when will my performance be reviewed? And is it possible to have a performance review, not in a year, but in six months? And if I'm shown to be performing you know, exceptionally, would you consider um, a substantial raise at that point once I prove myself? And that also gives employers a chance to say, okay, well, that seems fair. If you really, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how you'll work out, but if you work out great, then yeah, in six months, we can have a performance review and, and look at the compensation package at that point. So those are ways in which mid-career people can, can sort of address the issue of ageism and also try to bargain towards a compensation package that's fair. That being said, stereotypes abound about everybody and it's very frustrating. And if God forbid, you end up in a situation where you really feel like inappropriate things have been said and that you can really sense a degree of bias, you need to factor that into whether this is an organization you wanna work for or whether somebody else should know about the behavior of this organization, just saying. Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, no, thank you for that. It's uh, nice to think about kind of how some of these um, application process kind of fit within, you know, the scope of all of the jobs out there, not just the ones in the physics community. So yeah. that was wonderful. 
So unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for the official webinar. We apologize if we did not get to your questions and we encourage you to follow up by sending an email to webinars at APS.org um, and we'll forward your questions to Peter um, for comment. I also, a lot of the questions did get very specific around skills and career advancement. And so again, just to plug it, um, we will have an additional webinar in this series that's going to focus very specifically on those skills. And uh, so make sure you check that out. That will be in November. And just another reminder that um, this recorded video presentation will be made available on the APS webinar homepage. So please allow two to three business days for upload and take a moment to give us our feedback today before you leave by filling out this super short survey. Again, we really do value your feedback and uh, we would love for you to complete that survey. And Don't miss our future webinars and tell your friends. In fact, why don't you bring a whole bunch of people around the table? Pop up the web, the uh, laptop next time and we can all have a group discussion. But thank you guys very much. Appreciate you. Thank you all. And we will look forward to seeing you for the rest of the webinars in the series.